able to end. Okay, so um, have over here. All right, so uh, next week is when we start with Arena in Lab Five. So if you're interested in downloading Arena, it's a recommended way of having it on your own computers. Of course, the Arena is also available um, on the lab machines if you're using them. It's available in uh, Brickyard Two Fourteen. Um, yeah. You shouldn't, I wouldn't go, I, I'm surprised it's on my apps. Um, I would go, if you go to the Canvas page and uh, follow the installation instructions there, I, I've got a cached installer you can download from Canvas or you can go to Rockwell directly and just download because it's free for students. Yeah. So that my apps, I'm guessing because ASU does have a site license. Um, I think if a faculty member wanted to use Arena for their research, that's why that's there. Um, so, but the student version is free from Rockwell. Um, so yeah, so lab five, it'd be, uh, it's, you can get to arena from remote. We have two uh, modalities now, one where it connects effectively to a brickyard machine remotely. Another one where it uses a cloud-based third-party service. And that's what we're gradually transitioning over. It can be a little slow in part because whenever you run a simulation in arena, arena checks with a license server to see if it's still licensed and then runs. And so there's a lot of these like hand of these handshaking between it and the license server that for whatever reason are pretty slow in the cloud-based Aporto uh, mechanism. And they've tried to speed those up as much as possible, but I have a feeling that uh, no amount of complaining on my part is gonna get them any faster. So um, remote is definitely an option, but if you have the ability to install locally, that's gonna be the, the better way to do it from remote. If you have a Mac, if you have the ability to install um, a parallelization software, um, then that is going to be um, a way to go as well. But there are, you can get to it from remote. It just is a little slow uh, if you go through that remote way. So uh, that's that. Uh, like the homework, last time homework B1 solution sets are available. Uh, ICAs are available. Um, homework C2 is available. It's due uh, next lecture. It's a pretty straightforward homework assignment, but we're not gonna cover it until after it's formally due, but then you've got that four day grace period. And so we will overlap in coverage there. I, um, I kind of accelerated the due date of homework C2, um, just so we have enough time for you to get the next homework out and its solutions before the midterm. So you can study from the solutions for that one. So in homework C2, um, it's just two questions on random number generation. So you're gonna uh, do some random number generation for part one. Um, it's pretty much a plug and chug formula. And then in part two, you're going to be given a bunch of random numbers and you're going to run a Kolmogorov Smirnov test, which is a little bit like a chi squared test to see if they're appropriately random. So for um, question one, uh, make sure you include formulations, but given that each step it uses the same formula, then it's okay to sort of give me one formula and then you know to make it clear how you're plugging things in. Uh, and, Question two, if you summarize your results in a table like the book does, make sure you indicate uh, your formal formula use in the table headers. So if you look in the example that the book does, you can see how they've done that, where again, it's sort of a, um, a rote calculation of you know, some differences and so on. Just make sure you indicate what each column is, what, you know, what difference is being taken and so on. So if you mimic what the book does, you should be in good shape. If you're not familiar with this notation, it says this on the homework assignment too, A mod B, that means that um, this is as if you're dividing A by B and taking the remainder. So it's the remainder when dividing A by B. So if you do uh, five divided by four, uh, there's a remainder of one. So five mod four is one. Um, and that says that on the homework assignment there too. If you need um, other help, again, this is like a modified version of a book exercise. You should be able to find it there. I've also put videos in tips right along with the assignments. If you go to the assignment page on Canvas, all that's linked there. So there should be a smorgasbord of help. And of course, you can also send us notes if you need extra help. So that's homework C2. Homework D2 is also available. It's due um, a week after the next lecture. Um, 
It uh, is going to involve doing a little bit of calculus, some basic integration, a little bit of algebra, some inverting things, and, um, and that will prepare you for the inverse transform method stuff that we will see um, in uh, lectures, uh, uh, lectures E1 and E2, as well as uh, you will be, uh, that'll be something that will be kind of the last thing that's covered on the midterm. Um, there's uh, this Canvas activity coming up, ICAF, that's meant to be a midterm review. It's not available until after E1 has disappeared. It will randomly sample from previous ICAs and um, add in a few other questions. But most of the questions will be randomly sampled from previous ones. And you can take it as many times as you'd like and it'll give you the highest grade. Um, and it is a little longer than previous ICAs, so it has more points in it. So, um, you know, there is a drop policy with ICAs, but. I would recommend that you um, make use of ICAF as a midterm refresher. Um, and if you complete it and you complete it multiple times, you get a high score because it has um, three and a half times more points than a normal ICA, then um, it can buffer your scores for the ICAs that aren't dropped. So highly recommend you consider um, doing ICAF, which is a midterm review one. And then we're talking about the midterms, midterms about two and a half weeks away. Um, we get into more details as we get closer to it, but it is a multi or two stage exam. Uh, they will those two stages will replace the normal lecture times. You can still come to class to take them then, um, but they are um, a canvas based exam. So you'd have to bring a laptop or something to take them. Um, and uh, again, we'll get into details about that. But basically, stage one is an individual exam. Stage two is a group exam. It's the exact same exam. 80% stage one. 20% of your score is stage two. Stage two, you can work together. Stage one, you have to work on your own. Um, and there's no solution sets or scores in between the two stages. Uh, so we'll get into the details of that as we go on. Just putting that reminder up there, something to think about, it's about two and a half weeks away. Um, uh, if you're interested in the competition, we're getting close to the end of September. And um, the uh, Rockwell competition here, I think September 30th is the entry deadline. Uh, similar deadlines for the flex sim and simio competitions. So uh, that's all I got. Any questions about announcements for anything going forward? Questions online? Let me make sure I open up that uh, poll for these online questions as well. Uh, there's a, um, a question in the chat that says, where can we find the new textbook? I assume they, you mean the lab textbook. And uh, the lab textbook is available in the library. It's also available, it's downloadable from Canvas. So um, if you go to the textbook section of the course information, you'll find it there. So uh, like I said, it's, I've made it available, but you can also find it at the bookstore. You can also find it at the library. Um, any edition will do really after the third edition. It hasn't really changed much. And they haven't released a new edition since Arena came out with its new interface. and so. Um, the uh, so the, the the screenshots in the book are going to look like the older arena, so we have to deal with that. But, uh, so yeah, so you should be able to find the lab textbook in a number of different places. Again, it's on Canvas if you don't want to buy it. Okay. All right. So um, so today we're talking about probabilistic modeling. Why are we talking about probabilistic modeling? Um, because as we've talked about, uh, you know. The rest of the course is going to be about discrete event system simulation, which are stochastic models where we try to generate sims that have realistic variation, where the outputs of our sims are going to um, look like they go up and down, um, just like real world models. And in order to do that, we are going to use randomness as a source of the variation. So we're not saying that real model that real world systems are random we're saying that it would be hard for us to model all of the details deterministically, even if we live in a deterministic universe. So for the purposes of modeling, we use randomness instead, and it just makes the modeling simpler. And that's so-called stochastic modeling. Using randomness to simplify modeling is stochastic modeling. And so how do we choose the randomness? Well, input modeling selects the right probabilistic models that mimic whatever actual processes go into the realistic variation. So that's one perspective. The other perspective you can view is that we have a lot of uncertainty 
um, because we just don't know all of those details out there and uncertainty is a source of randomness. And so from that perspective, our knowledge of the real world um, necessarily requires us to use randomness because that's how uncertainty shows itself. So regardless of what philosophical stance you're taking here, either we're using randomness to make modeling more convenient or because it's impossible for us to have certainty, we're adding noise because that really does not match our understanding of the world. It's a, um, it's a basic simplistic understanding of how the world works plus noise. Either way, if we want realistic variation, we have to use randomness inside our models. So we can't get away from randomness. And so we have to talk about probability, which is the mathematical structure that helps us get a handle on randomness. And probability theory, um, is a branch of what's called measure theory. Measure theory is a, is, uh, is a the, the sort of the branch of mathematics that allows you to measure the size of sets in a way that makes sense. So if I have a set like this, if this little set somehow fits into this medium sized set, somehow fits into this bigger set, if I have a measure of the set, then I should be able to say that this little set maps to one part of the real line, the bigger set maps to a later part of the real line, and the larger set maps to a larger part of the real line. So in other words, if I come up with a good way to measure the size of sets, then it should be the case that if I take the measure of a set, whether it be something that looks like this or something that looks like this, if I cut that set in pieces, then each measure of each individual piece should be smaller and all the measures should add up to, uh, to the big one here. So that's really what measure theory is all about. Integration, which we normally just, you know, at um, early in kind of your college career, we just say, oh, that's calculus. The subject of integration comes from measure theory. Because if you think about what you're doing when you're integrating under a curve is you're effectively assigning a number to an entity, which is sort of a set. And so that, is what you know integrals do and that's why integrations used so much in probability theory so probability theory is a subset of uh, measure theory and so um when we talk about things out of probability theory we're often going to use language of measure theory um so like we talk about a random variable well a random variable mathematically is neither random nor a variable it's a mapping of outcomes to what we call a measurable space. So if I go back to my measure theory diagram here, I, in order for me to assign a weight, W-E-I-G-H-T, you know, a size to these sets, I have to somehow have a way to take these sets and map them to a number line and then have a way to then add up kind of all of those contributions. And that's what a random variable does is it takes uh, outcomes that happen in the real world, like someone arrives at this time, someone arrives at this other time, the die comes up four, the die comes up six, and it maps those outcomes, which are not numerical, to some uh, numerical representation. And um, outcomes, this term outcomes, are mutually exclusive results of an experiment. So when I use the term outcome, um, I'm, the outcome itself is not a set. Outcome is one thing that could happen. The experiment could end this way or that way. Those are two outcomes. So the measure space um, is typically taken to be the, all of the real numbers. And so every particular way an experiment could end, a random variable maps to one real number. And so, um, so this is a way to organize numerically something so that um, outcomes in the real world can be quantified. Their, um, their uncertainty can be quantified and mathematically modeled. And so the example I have here is if I throw up a bunch of coins, the number of coins landing heads up is a random variable. So the actual outcomes are the states of these coins that are landing on the ground. There's only numerical about them. There's just a bunch of coins, some are heads, some are tails. I can choose to map the outcome of that experiment of throwing the coins up and seeing what they're going down there to the number of heads. I can say, oh, that's six heads. And so I can map that outcome to the real number line. And that would be a random variable. So that's kind of our example we'll mean by random variables. So formally, the more you do with probability theory, you will see this notation here, where a random variable is not 
written as a variable, it's written as a function where it's a random variable X is a function that maps from the sample space. Those are all of the outcomes to a measure space, which is the real line in most cases. So this omega here, we call the sample space. It is the set of all mutually exclusive outcomes from an experiment. And the so-called range of a random variable are, um, which we would write as this image here. So if the, if there is the mathematically speaking, we refer to the range as the image of the sample space uh, through the random variable. And so if you take all of the possible outcomes and map them to all of the possible numbers that they can map to in the real line, the real, the subset of the real line is the so-called range of the random variable. For convenience, this uh, function is often just replaced by its name. So we often refer to just random variable X, but the mechanics of what's going on behind the scenes sometimes require us to remember that it is not a variable. It is a mapping, it's a function. So that's kind of the fundamentals there of where probability theory fits into measure theory. Now, um, what do we do with those? Well, we take those outcomes and if we put a set of them together, we uh, create what in uh, measure theory and probability theory is called an event. Now, this is not the same event as in a discrete event system. This is just the mathematicians call it an event is a set of outcomes. So, um, you know, I've got some outcomes up here, like a six-sided die shows four dots. Jeremy is the only student who shows up in class. But events are subsets of the sample space, like, um, you know, it could be singletons. So the same thing, a six-sided die shows a four, Jeremy is the only student, or a six-sided die shows at least four dots. So now I'm grouping outcomes together. So it's sets of outcomes. So there's, you have single outcomes, which are just elements of the sample space. And then I have so-called events and events are sets of outcomes. And those events are what we are going to assign probability as we'll see. So this is just language that we use in probability here. All right, so each random variable is also associated with what we refer to as a probability measure, which is typically written as capital upright P lowercase r. Um, sometimes people abbreviate that with just a big P, but, uh, but formally that's kind of a formal notation there. And this is a scale that can weigh the event sets. So this is the thing that actually assigns the number to the set. And so um, this uh, probability measure must guarantee a conservation of mass. And what we mean by that is if you weigh an event set and then you weigh subsets of it, it can never be the case that the subsets weights add up to more than the whole event to begin with. Likewise, if you weigh all of the mutually exclusive events and you add up all those things together, they can't add up to more than the sample space weighs. So this idea of mass, really that's what measure theory, um, measure theory wasn't invented for probability, it was invented for a much bigger set of problems that have to do with how do we deal with mass? How do we deal with the fact that objects in physical space have mass? And when you cut them up, they have less mass. And when you put them back together, they have the same mass again. Measure theory was the mathematical framework that helps us deal with mass. And probability is just a analog to that. So when you think about, well, what, how do I conceptualize probability? In your head, you should think of it mechanically. Probability is a mass. And that's where terms like density come up. You know, we talk about the density of this table, that will be a direct analog to probability density, which we'll get to here uh, very shortly. So um, probability is a scale that can weigh events. Um, event weights are the sum of their outcome weights and the weight of the entire sample space omega is always one. So we just normalize the weight of the universe to be one. And uh, the weight of any event is non-negative, the same way the weight of anything in physical space is non-negative. So those are sort of the rules that must occur for every probability measure. 
All right, so any questions about these definitions so far? I know this is probably all review, but I'm um, just trying to make sure that we're all on the same page with the terms we're using, outcomes, events, probability measures, and so on, and trying to set us up to never think about probability as a weird separate thing. Probability is mass. If you understand mass, you understand probability. And we'll see that more and more. Uh, there was a question online about the group portion of the exam. Is it only in, per, or, um, we'll get into the, the exam uh, details, but um, in the group portion of the exam, uh, stage two, you will be able to meet outside of class uh, just as long as you're meeting only with people currently enrolled in this class. And so stage two of the exam, you'll be free to take it wherever you want. You'll be free to collaborate. You can go into Discord, you can go into Slack, uh, whatever. Um, but uh, all of you should be in this class who are working on stage two. All of you will have already taken stage one. So you'll have that shared experience. Um, so again, we'll get to those details as we go. Are there any other questions about these definitions or the exam, I guess? Okay. All right. So um, we now have to talk about, you know, do we have discrete or continuous random variables? So a discrete random variable is one whose range is countably uh, infinite. Um, sorry, finite or countably infinite. It can be finite as well. So this is not the same discrete that we have in discrete event systems. Um, a discrete random variable um, has to do with kind of not the discreteness of time, but the discreteness of space. And so uh, an example here would be like um, the number of jobs arriving to a job shop. Well, that could be anything from zero to infinity, but we can assign each one of those outcomes to uh, the integers basically. So they're countable. And so if you can assign, if that probability mapping doesn't need the whole real line, if it can assign itself um, potentially to the integers, then it's discrete. Um, if it's finite, um, so a subset of the integers, then that's also discrete. So, um, so that's the difference between discrete and continuous here is that the range is finite or countably infinite. So in those cases, we can write the range as a set um, and we can use these shorthands like the little p probability of any particular outcome in the range um, is, this is a shorthand for the big probability that the random variable is equal to that outcome. So this is sort of a mapping. So we often use this shorthand with discrete random variables and what carries over with our properties of probability little p of any outcome is greater than or equal to zero and the sum of all of them equal to one. So we refer to this little p function as the probability mass function or PMF. And the collection of the outcomes in the probability mass functions is the probability distribution of X. So probability mass, mass is associated with discrete random variables. And like I said, a job shop here, um, we could assign a probability to each one of these zero uh, jobs arrived this week, one arrived early this week, two arrived this week. Uh, but even if it's infinite, the sum of all those together has to equal one. So that's a discrete random variable. Any questions about what I mean by discrete random variables and countable ranges? Questions online? Okay. All right, so, uh, so another example of that, so six-sided die, um, X, that random variable, represents the number of spots based up on a die after a toss. I could specify that this die is unfair, so it's weighted so that the probability of a given face is proportional to the number of spots or dots showing on the face. And so um, if I were to write that, um, I would write that as the probability of getting one spot is one out of 21, two is two out of 21, all the way up to six is six out of 21. Um, so where P is the probability mass function associated with X, why are there 21 in all the denominators here? Anybody? So um, I could have just said one, two, three, four, five, six, and that would have ensured that the probability 
of it coming up six to six times as much the probability of it coming up one. But why did I have to divide them all by 21? There are 21, uh, yeah, there's, we could think of it as, we, there are the numerators here all add up to 21. So, um, so that's the kind of key point here is that, that, yeah, you could think of it as there's 21 dots um, and that's one, you know, but in, but what's the significance of that when it comes back to probability? The sum of all the probabilities have to add up to one. And the only way that happens is if we normalize um, by the sum of all these numerators here. So we can often specify probability um, without giving all of the numbers out. We can just say that this outcome is twice as likely as this outcome. That outcome is three times as likely as that outcome. And sometimes we get those specifications. Like people will say, well, I don't know what the probability mass function is, but I know that this particular outcome happens 10 times as much as this other outcome. And so when you come, when you're actually doing the modeling, you write down those relationships and then you keep in mind that all probabilities have to be greater than zero and the sum has to equal one. So once you write down all the relationships, then you then write down the last relationships so they all have to add up to equal to one. And then that will tell you how to normalize them. In this case, if you normalize them all by dividing by 21, you ensure that they all add up to one. So does that make sense? Just trying to make sure that all the probabilities add up to one so I can specify relationships, so then I have to normalize afterwards. So this is consistent with this description, but it's also uh, consistent with our rule that they add up to one. Okay. All right, so that's uh, discrete. Uh, we can visualize discrete random variables using um, these sorts of plots. So, um, so each one of these things is called a Dirac delta measure. It doesn't really matter, but that's formally what it's called. Um, and so they kind of look like little hairpins when they're plotted this way with a dot on top and then coming down here. And that just indicates that like um, a child standing at a spot on a seesaw, it's concentrating all the mass at that point. So there's one out of 21 concentrated here, two out of 21 there, three out of 21, all the way up to six out of 21 there. So we will often uh, draw discrete random variables this way. It's a little bit of a pet peeve of mine when people plot discrete random variables continuously. So notice that I did not connect these dots because there are no outcomes in between. So there should be no mass in between. So there's only outcomes one through six. So I wouldn't connect, I wouldn't draw a line connecting these because that would indicate that there might sometimes be a 1.5 outcome or 1.4 outcome. So when you plot discrete random variables, you typically plot them with stem plots like these, um, or like I say, uh, with uh, Dirac delta measures. That's another way to sort of formally say it. So each one of these is a, is a measure, but stem plots. So if you're going in a MATLAB, or whatever, you would use a stem plot to plot a P. Uh, a probability mass function. Do not do a generic plot that interpolates because it's totally different. Okay, so questions about any of that? All make sense to discrete random variables? And there was a, I think that question about stage two showed up on the, poll as well, and I think I answered that earlier. Okay. All right, so now the other half of it, continuous random variables, which are weirder to get your head around. But again, if you don't worry about probability and think about it as mass, if you think about it, this is your statics, not statistics, your statics class, then this should all make sense immediately. So a continuous random variable, um, is uh, where its range is an interval or collection of intervals. And so it doesn't exist at discrete points, it exists on a continuum. And the, we have a probability density function of this random variable, which represents the density, not the probability, the density um, of, the, uh, this, of this random variable. And so it's kind of like when I, I, I pick up this table, this table has a weight. And that weight represents the total probability in the whole distribution. That's like 
the area underneath this curve. But if I were to sort of look at a particular point or slice of this table, I wouldn't weigh a slice. I would talk about its density. I would say for every inch I add to this table, how much heavier does it get? And so that tells me about its density. So density is very different than probability or than mass. So the, and I'll give these examples here in a second, even though this table might weigh, I don't know, 30 pounds, the density has a totally different unit. Because remember the density might be in pounds per square inch if it's a linear density, or sorry, if the area density it might be in pounds per linear inch if it's a linear density. And the density could be greater than 30, even though the table is 30 pounds, the density at any particular point in the table could be 100 pounds per square inch or 100 pounds per linear inch. But that might just mean that farther down the table, the density gets less. So density does not have to be bound by the total probability, the total mass and probability density will not be bound by one. It is not a probability. PDFs, probability density is not probability. So that's what we're talking about here. So the PDF is such that uh, density, like density, like mass density, density is always greater than zero. Uh, density is equal to zero if uh, it's not in the range. So if the outcome doesn't occur, it has no density. The key thing here is the integral of the density over the range is equal to one. That's just saying that if I integrate under the density of the table, I'll get the mass of the table. But the densities themselves can be greater than one. Density is a totally different unit. One of the downsides, I think, of mathematicians and measure theory is they don't think in terms of units because it's all very abstract. We, we should have given units. We should have said that probability has a unit of prob and probability density has a unit of uh, prob per um, you know, unit outcome or something like that. That would be uh, something I think would prevent a lot of confusion. But unfortunately, conventionally, probability density and probability are both viewed as unitless. So it's often you think, well, probability density sounds like it's probability, but it's not. It's a totally different quantity. And that's why densities can be greater than one. Water's density can be numerically greater than the weight of a, of a cup of it. Um, similarly, an infinitesimal droplet of the sun has no mass, even though it has huge density. And so that's why if I cut an infinitesimal slice of this table, you know, a little pancake of this table, and I held it up and then I weighed it, it would probably come up as zero mass. Now its density wouldn't be zero because the density is uniform throughout the table. So that's the reason why when you, um, integrate that why a point outcome in a continuous random variable has zero probability, but it has non-zero density. The same reason why you can have non-zero density at an infinitesimal point of a table. But if I pull that infinitesimal point out somehow and put it on a scale, it'll come up with zero mass because it's, it doesn't, that density doesn't get multiplied by anything. You know, it doesn't actually have volume. So mass comes from the combination of density and volume. Probability comes from the combination of probability density and outcome volume. So it's the exact same thing. So I give kind of these examples here. This is a probability density function. And I've got a, a, a single outcome at a point and I've got a range of outcomes. Well, the, um, if I mentally think of this is a block that has this shape where it's going to be heavier on this end because there's more of it and lighter on this end because there's less of it that if i take an infinitesimal slice of the block anywhere the weight of that slice regardless of where i take it in the block is going to be equal to zero even though the density of a slice here is going to be higher than the density of a slice here but if I cut a sub block out of it, I would cut this little block in the middle of it, that thing will actually have mass. So that's exactly what's happening with probability density is that the density at a point is you're taking that density and you're multiplying it by zero volume and you get nothing out. But if you integrate under the density function across the range, now you've got density times volume and you'll actually get real probability out. 
So an interval is a weight of a slice. Um, and so that's why we actually get a weight, but an infinitesimal point is not. So you can, any probability density function, you should conceptualize as a block with total weight one. All right, any questions about that? And it should be all review, but um, so it may be a little slow. I just want to make sure that, you know, at least we have these issues that, um, you know, a lot of times students are really stuck thinking that like density has to be less than one and so on and so forth, but they're just totally different quantities. Okay. All right, so this example, um, I could have an exponential random variable, for example, of, you know, a device that inspects, so the lifetime of device that inspects cracks in, a, in an aircraft wing. So how long until this thing fails? That's its lifetime. So this is an example where I might model with an exponential random variable. My constraint would be that its range would have to be non-negative because it's a lifetime. And I might be given its mean as two years. And so it might be that it's well described by an exponential random variable. And so this, um, I don't know when it's going to fail, but um, I can ask, uh, what's the probability that it will fail between years three and four? or between months three and four, whatever my units are here. So if I ask what's the probability it will fail at month three, it's always gonna be zero. But if I give it a little bit of volume and say what's the probability it'll fail between three and four, now we're actually integrating some of that density. And so I can actually calculate the probability that I'll get a failure in that window. So that's an example of something we would model that way. So, um, uh, this mean, though, I specified, we haven't talked about what mean even means yet, and we'll get to that. Um, but I hope when you look at this, if I were to plot the mean there, it starts looking like that would be the place where this block would balance. And that's exactly what mean is. It's the center of mass of a distribution. So we'll get to that in a second. So any questions about this example or about continuous random variables in general? You know, all sort of 380, 385 stuff. Okay. All right. So um, we've defined probability density and probability mass. So the last important quantity we have to define that we're going to use a lot in this class is the CDF, the cumulative distribution function, often written as capital F. Um, sometimes um, when we have multiple random variables we're kicking around, it'll have a subscript of the random variable you're referring to. So it might be F sub X, F sub Y, uh, usually with the capital X or Y in that case. And um, it's formally defined as the probability that the random variable of interest is less than or equal to whatever the argument is. So um, for a discrete random variable, it's just the sum of all outcomes that are less then whatever outcomes is in the argument, the sum of the probabilities of those outcomes. For a continuous random variable, it's the integral under the density function from negative infinity all the way up to the outcome that's in the argument. And so we're just summing up probabilities, basically. How much does the block weigh from this point down? Um, how much does uh, the, do these particular outcomes weigh from this outcome down? That's the discrete versus the continuous. It has really nice properties because of its cumulative distribution function. If um, uh, outcomes A are, is less than outcome B, then the cumulative distribution at A will be less than the, or equal to the cumulative distribution at B. Um, it always ends at one, it always starts at zero. And the probability of, uh, if you wanna calculate what's the probability of any interval, it's just going to be the CDF of the upper bound of the interval minus the CDF of the lower bound of the interval. So really super useful property. So if I gave you a probability density function and it's cumulative, and I asked you to calculate the probability of an interval, you could go through the trouble of integrating under the density function, or you could just plot or plug in B into the CDF and A into the CDF and subtract, and then you don't have to do any integration. So the CDF is a great way to get around doing integration because it's already been done for you. So any questions about the CDF? Again, it's just a probability 
that were less than whatever the argument of the CDF is. Questions online? All right. So uh, we often represent CDFs visually um, when uh, we do so. Um, for discrete random variables, we usually use stair plots for this, um, for the same reason we use stem plots to do probability mass functions. So um, I've got my die problem from earlier with one, one over 21 up through six through 21 for the probability masses. The cumulative distributions, um, it starts out one over 21, but then it starts adding. One plus two is three, three plus three is six, six plus four is 10, 10 plus five is 15, 15 plus six is 21. So as expected, it's zero to the left of the first outcome, and it's one at the last outcome and everything to the right of it. And so it has this non-decreasing shape. And I've plotted it here where um, it's, uh, it, it's got these steps that exist in kind of the, the lower corner of the step all the way to the next outcome, and then they jump back up. So this is the traditional way we would plot a, a CDF for a discrete random variable with these stair plots that have the, that are filled in on the lower side of the step or sort of the beginning of the step and are open at the end of the step. So any questions about that? Pretty clear. CDF plotted that way. Again, I don't don't ever plot a discrete CDF continuously. If it's a CDF of a discrete random variable, it needs to be plot with uh, a stair plot. All right. So one of the cool things we can do with a CDF is um, if I have the CDF here, and, and I already sort of talked about this in lab three, if I draw a random number uniformly distributed between zero and one, graphically, wherever that number lands on the y-axis, I can then map it down to an outcome. And by doing so, I can generate whatever probability mass function I want. This is a so-called inverse transform method that we're going to learn about in lecture E2 um, and kind of lecture E1 as well. And so this, um, this idea here allows me to take a readily available source of randomness in the computer, uniform random numbers between zero and one, and turn them into any discrete random variable I want. The same way a board game would turn a die roll into outcomes based on a, a rule set that's on a card where you know if the die is above 10 you do this if it's between 8 and 10 you do this and so on and so forth this gives me a quick way to do that for any arbitrary probability mass function and once you have the cdf you use what's called the inverse cdf and you can get, generate those outcomes and you're guaranteed that the outcome of that will have a probability mass that matches as desired so that's what we'll talk about in lecture e2 that's one of the cool things we can do with CDS. For continuous random variables, the CDF again is the integral from negative infinity to X. So in this case, here's an exponential CDF. Um, exponentials have zero mass, uh, zero density to the left of the axis here. So it just rises up like, a, um, and then eventually rounds out at one. So it starts at zero, it gets to one, and it's non-decreasing as expected. Um, and uh, likewise, as we'll learn, um, if I wanted to draw an exponential random variable, if I just invert the CDF, if you give me the CDF, and then you draw a random number between zero and one, I can plot, or I can take the inverse of that, and the resulting output will be exponentially distributed. So I can draw from exponentials, even though the computer only generates uniforms. And that's one of the reasons why we see you know, so many CDFs in this class, is that a CDF is a gateway for us to draw any random variable that we want. Okay, so questions about any of those things? A lot of the definitions here, PDFs, CDFs, PMFs, everything seemed clear. Okay, all right, so um, last thing we need to talk about is moments. And as uh, so I said, we'll define mean in a moment, kind of a pun uh, referring to this sort of expected value. So the expected value here, um, it looks like an arbitrary definition, like, uh, but for a, a discrete random variable, 
It's just you take all of the outcomes in the range and you multiply each outcome by its probability and you sum all of those things up. For a continuous random variable, it's a similar idea. You take all of the outcomes from negative infinity to infinity, you multiply them by their density and you take the area underneath that curve. Um, and so this is our formal definition of, this, of uh, the expected value. Where does this come from? Well, it is again, the center of mass of the distribution. So in statics, um, if you were given though, you know, if you said like there are six children and they're standing on a seesaw and here's the weights of all those six children, where would you put the fulcrum of the seesaw to balance them? You would calculate this. This would be um, the distance uh, a child was from a random point, an arbitrary point on the seesaw. And this would be the mass of that child. And if you summed up all of those things together, each one of these, um, it's like a, a moment, right? You know, force times distance is a moment. Um, then if you sum up all those, you get the center of mass of all of those children. And that's what the mean is. Um, likewise, with the continuous random variable, if I want to figure out where the center of mass of this table is, and you tell me the density of this table, and that density, it might for some reason be denser here than it is over here. If I take each density and multiply it by their distance to some arbitrary point on the table, and take the, air, the integral underneath that, it tells me where I can put a balance so I can set this table up on it and it'll balance. So that's what the center of mass is. So we refer to it as the mean, we refer to it as the first moment or the first, uh, well, we don't say first central moment, but the mean of the first moment of that. And I'm just drawing out what I'm saying here. So here's an exponential PDF, probability density function. There's where its mean is. If I were to imagine a block, of uniform density that was cut into this shape, then that point is where I would balance underneath it. So you can see that the extra mass to the left of this point is balanced out by the tiny little bit of mass that is way out here, like, like a lever. And so, um, so there's leverage of these points here. Sometimes we use the term statistical leverage when we refer to outliers. Outliers have statistical leverage. What that means is that an outlier is gonna change the mean. So means we know are very sensitive to outliers. So, and what that means is that you might have one point that's way over here and it may not occur very often, but it has such a long distance from all of the others that when it does occur, it sort of affects the, it, the, the fact that it can occur um, is going to shift the mean in a way that is probably um, not useful. So that's what we mean by statistical leverage. It's identical to leverage in the physical world. All right, so does that make sense what I'm saying here? So mean is just the center of mass. I should be able to show you a probability density function and your mental model of how mass works should allow you to guess where the mean is, even if um, you haven't done the math. Right. Does that make sense? Are we good with that? All right. So um, we can also define what we call higher order moments. And all we're doing is we take the exact same definition, but we put an exponent on the outcome. So the second moment, for example, of a uh, discrete random variable is going to be the probability times the square of each one of its outcomes. The third moment is the cube and so on. With uh, likewise for a continuous random variable, we take the, the outcomes and we cube them or square them. Um, and then we take the area underneath the product of them and their density function. And so um, these moments um, give us tools for calculating other things that are meaningful, like for example, the variance. So the variance of a random variable, which captures the spread of that random variable formally is defined as this ugly thing. It's the expected value of a new random variable formed by taking the current random variable minus its mean and that whole thing, those differences squared. The expected value of that is the so-called variance, which can measure the spread. Mathematically, we can, instead of writing this ugly thing, we can actually write identically the second moment minus the square of the mean. And that will give me the exact same thing. So it's usually much easier to calculate moments, second moments, than central moments. 
So rather than having to deal with this ugliness, um, we might in fact already have a table of these things. And so that's the reason why we kind of need to know these moments is that moments are sort of easier to calculate, they're easier to tabulate, they're easier to have on hand. And if we have those moments on hand, we can use them to calculate other things like variance. Standard deviations of square root of variance, as you all know, um, we'll use the symbol sigma for standard deviation and sigma squared for variance. Any questions about that? Okay. All right, so um, let's do a, um, yeah, let's do an attendance uh, question here. So I'll put that, I can find, I have the hardest time for there, finding my mouse when I'm connected to this projector for some reason. Okay, there. All right, so uh, attendance question. Well, let's do um, the, um, what is the center of mass of a, um, of a random variable? So what's another name for the center of mass of a random variable? All right, so, so those are kind of probability fundamentals. So, um, so that should be kind of all review. So where do we go from here? So we're gonna go from here is we're going to turn um, these static definitions of random variables into definitions of what we call random processes. And random processes are things that uh, actually allow us to introduce dynamics. So we'll be able to talk about like how queuing not networks can be viewed through the lens of probability. So that's something that we're going through there. And that's gonna be really important because a lot of things we simulate um, look a lot like queuing networks. Um, we're also gonna say, all right, so what are the most common distributions that we use in modeling and how do we choose them? So I mentioned, you know, we might use an exponential. Well, how do we know we need an exponential? Why don't I use a Weibull for that? So we need to build up our intuition to when is a normal distribution the right choice, when is an exponential the right choice, when is a uniform the right choice, and so on. And we need to do that not only for continuous, but also for discrete. When is the binomial the variable the right choice, when is a Poisson the right choice, and so on. And how do they all relate to each other? How does a Poisson discrete random variable relate to an exponential continuous? And that's gonna be really important as we sort of conceptualize what's going on in our simulation models. So that's kind of where we're going. Um, and that's actually all I've got for you today. So um, the, that last attendance question I gave you a couple of minutes ago, that will be the attendance question for the day. So if you don't have any questions for me, that's all I got for you. Otherwise, happy to take questions. Are there any questions? All right, well, in that case, um, hope you have a good weekend. We will see you Tuesday. Any other questions online? If not, then I will go ahead and end the room.